This morning we embark on a two-part sermon series. The first is in the historical record of Genesis chapters 1 through 11. I specifically put in that statement the historical record of Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And the second is in the book of Revelation. I have titled the first part of our series from made to marred and the second part of our series from marred to remade. My aim in this sermon series will neither be to answer every question that people might pose, we have not the time for that, nor will it be to dwell upon scientific matters, philosophical musings or apocalyptic speculations. Rather, these messages, I hope, will speak clearly to us about who God is, about who he has created us to be, and about what he has called us to do. That is what the opening chapters of Genesis are most certainly about. They were written by Moses to the Hebrew people amid their exodus from Egypt. The Egyptians, not unlike our world today, were misguided by the worship of false gods. So the Israelites, having been engrossed for many years in that pluralistic, pantheistic Egyptian culture, would certainly have been asking, who was this Yahweh that had delivered them? To their queries, Moses responds that Yahweh was, I am. Yahweh was the one true, self-sufficient, self-existing, eternal, all-powerful God. All the little G gods were merely pre-existing made things like sun gods, our animal gods, our fertility gods. In short, everything that people falsely worshipped then and everything that people falsely worship now are merely things that the living God has created. So Moses does not write an astrology book about the function of galaxies and the nature of its stars. He does not write a geology book about the age of the earth. He does not write a paleontology book about what happened to the dinosaurs. He does not write an anthropology book or a sociology book about all the different people groups. No, Moses is writing a theological redemptive book. He is writing about the creator who creates. He writes about the personhood of God and what that practically means for us. Perhaps this all seems a bit odd, seeing as how Moses was born well after the unfolding events of Genesis. Where would Moses have compiled that which he communicates? For one, there were accounts likely handed down in families on tablets of stone, which can trace back to Genesis 5, verse 1, and the words, This is the book of the generations of Adam. That is language repeated at nine more times, with the last record being at Genesis 37 and verse 2. Second, Patriarchs such as Jacob left behind physical structures to provide remembrance of various happenings. Third, Joseph would have likely kept detailed records of Hebrew ancestry during his years in Egypt. No doubt there was also a strong oral history among the Jewish community, a history that Moses' mother would have shared with him before he went to live in Pharaoh's palace. Most importantly, like all authors of the biblical record, Moses received direct inspiration from the Holy Spirit. It is under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Moses begins with the profound truth of our text for today. It is only one verse. It is the first verse, Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. So it is 
In the opening sentence of Scripture, we are brought into the presence of God. In fact, God's name appears 31 more times in the 30 verses that follow in this first chapter. God is clearly the subject of creation. John Phillips says it is no wonder Satan hates that chapter. It is no wonder he has brought up his heavy artillery to discredit it in the minds of men. You see, Satan knows that if we abandon what the Holy Spirit teaches about creation, we will soon find ourselves abandoning what the Holy Spirit teaches about salvation. Satan knows that if we question what the Holy Spirit says about the start of history in Genesis chapter 1, what's to stop us from questioning the end of history in Revelation chapter 22? We must reject adamantly any and every claim that suggests the first 11 chapters of Genesis is somehow mythical or somehow allegorical. It is not. If the first Adam is simply an allegory, why would the same not be true of the second Adam? If humanity did not really fall into a state of sin, why would we need a Savior at all? Apart from the Genesis account, faith in Jesus Christ for one's redemption can easily become just a moral lesson. We must readily acknowledge that the living God confronts us as the one who was in existence before anything we can even imagine and who will be there after anything we can ever imagine. Ultimately, it is to him and him alone that we must give answer. Let us readily acknowledge that the creator who creates is powerful. Think the how of creation. Around the year 1965, researchers announced the creation of artificial protein in a lab. Now, since protein is the basic building block of life, a famous British biochemist confidently asserted that in a few more decades, scientists would be creating life. I no longer find it necessary to believe in God, he said. Someone from the Sunday Evening Post then interviewed a spokesperson for the Archdiocese of New York who was unimpressed by the various scientific claims. When a biochemist is able to create matter and energy out of nothing, he said, come back and see me. The word for created in Genesis 1 verse 1 is the Hebrew term bara. It's a word reserved in scripture for the distinctive work of God because it contains the exclusive notion of creating ex nihilo. That is a Latin word for out of nothing. When our children and grandchildren come home to us with their latest art project from school, they may say, look at what I created. Of course, we realize that they have merely made something with the materials that they have been given. You see, man can make things, asa in Hebrew. Man can form things, yatsa in Hebrew. But only God can create things, bara. Only the omnipotent God can call things into being from nothing. Harold Fortescue was a budding newspaper reporter, and on his first assignment, the editor sent him to cover a significant local social function. In his enthusiasm, Fortescue wrote a glowing 10-page expose. Yet, to his dismay, the editor never even read his report. Instead, he immediately handed the article back and told Fortescue to cut it in half. Fortescue complied. 
Only when he returned, the editor once more did not even read it. Instead, he handed it back to him and said, cut it in half again. Grumbling under his breath, the youthful reporter did as he was told. And then he came back a third time when the editor said, reduce it now to a single page. Fortescue began to openly protest, but his boss cut him off. Young man, the editor said, you have obviously overlooked how the creator of the universe introduced the entire creation narrative in only 10 English words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John Phillips says, there it stands. In all its naked force, the opening statement of Scripture, no attempt is made to water it down. No attempt is made to apologize to a skeptical age. No attempt is made even to prove that God exists. The Holy Spirit simply deems certain truths to be self-evident. The first and foremost, that God is. God is. Something has to exist from all eternity because it is impossible for nothing to come from nothing. Either you must believe in an eternal self-existing God or you must believe in an eternal self-existing universe. Those are your only choices. At the root of the great scientific fallacy known as evolution is the notion that the universe emerged from a hot, dense state at some infinite time in the past. Yet as Henry Morris explains, random particles of matter could not by themselves generate a complex, orderly, intelligible universe, not to mention generate living persons capable of applying intelligence to the understanding of such a complex universe. We need a purposing, personal God who gives form and meaning to an otherwise disorderly, impersonal universe. Let us then readily acknowledge that the creator who creates is purposeful and personal. Thank the why for creation. R.C. Sproul writes, if our past history tells us that we have emerged from the slime, that we are only grown up germs, what difference can it possibly make whether we are black germs or white germs, whether we are free germs or enslaved germs? Who cares? We can sing about the dignity of man, but unless that dignity is rooted substantially in that which has intrinsic value, all our songs of human rights and dignity are so much as whistling in the dark. But you and I did not evolve over billions of years from germs. There are far too many problems with such a notion, one of the main problems being that the fossil records simply don't add up. If evolution were true, if it were scientifically factual, we should expect to find within the fossil records finely graded and generally continuous development from the simplest forms to the higher forms, but we don't. There are no gradual developments. On the contrary, the major groups appear suddenly with little to no evidence of transition. Evolutionists argue, well, the fossil record is simply incomplete. And if the fossils uh, for every part of form of life existed, then the gaps that we have would be filled, except it's not just several missing links. There are hundreds of them. The biblical creation account, even though we cannot prove everything, is far more reasonable, much more meaningful, and holds eternal consequence. 
Will we still have questions surrounding various issues about creation? I imagine if we are honest thinkers, we must admit so. After all, no one but God existed in the beginning. And speaking to Job, the creator who creates, says in the book of Job, chapter 38 and verse 4, Where were you when I laid earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. That is why the writer to Hebrews declares in chapter 11 and verse 3, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. As for me, I have faith in what Genesis says, that the universe exists with form and personality because God called it into being, and He is both purposeful and personal. You cannot pray to energy. You cannot voice your pleas or express your hurts to some impersonal mass. But if God is God, our whole outlook changes at once. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, same in substance, equal in power and glory, but different in function. Michael Reeves explains, here is a God who is not essentially lonely, but who has been loving for all eternity as Father has loved the Son in the Spirit. Loving others is not a strange or novel thing for our God. It is at the root of who He is. And this is paramount to our understanding of creation for two significant reasons. First, the God of the Bible did not create because He needed anything. He was and is and always shall be complete within Himself. Second, the God of the Bible did create because it is His purpose within His triune personhood to share His love. If we embrace that truth by faith, it should lead us to readily acknowledge that the Creator who creates is praiseworthy. Thank the so what to creation. The psalmist sings out in Psalm 148, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. The Word for created at the end of Psalm 148, verse 5, in the Hebrew language, is the same word found in Genesis 1-1, for created. It is once more the word bara. Bara. To take that which is non-existent and call into existence that which is not. So it was at the creation in the beginning, and so it is what we all need for our own exodus. King David begins Psalm 51 and verse 10 praying, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Did you perhaps catch the first word? Create. Create in Hebrew is, as you guessed, bara. David asked the Creator who creates to take that which is non existent and make it to exist. He asked for the Creator who creates to give him a clean heart. It is within God's power alone to do it, and it is from His loving person to make it so. More than anything else this morning, I pray that you can see how God's absolute power in creation 
undergirds the language of the new creation that we all desperately need and that we can only experience through Christ's shared love. It is a new creation made possible because Christ entered into the world that he spoke into existence. It is a new creation made possible because Christ died for the world that he spoke into existence. Has the creator who creates given you a new heart? Bara. Have you experienced his shared love? If so, I invite you today to the Lord's table. I invite you today to where Christ's body is represented as being broken, where his blood represented as being shed for us. It is the means by which we are made New. First in our hearts and soon through a new heaven and a new earth. And there is only one who can bring that about. I promise you it is not the eternality of matter. The only one who can bring that about in our lives is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today I invite you, if you have asked God to bring into you a new heart, to take that which is non-existent and make it so, today if you have done that, this table, this meal is for you. But if you have not yet done that, Once more, I tell you, do not come, but allow the elements to be a testimony to what God has done for you. And may it cause you to say, create in me a clean heart, O God. As you come today, I ask from the front towards the back that you come down the middle aisle and then you Go back to the outer aisle and return to your seat in that fashion. And once everyone has received the elements and returned to their seat, we will partake of them together. Let's stand and come. Mm-hmm.